and welcome to another episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Um, today's guest, well, I I know her mostly, for foremost, well, I think widely most of us do, as a judge on the Great British Bake Off, but she's actually an author, a cookie writer, a journalist, and and actually I've read her um, her autobiography and, it, and your life is so vast and amazing. Uh, you're also a mum of two adults and a grandma. It's Prue Leith. <laughs> Hi. Hello. When you when your children turn forty five or forty six, you know you're old. <laughs> Does it feel weird coming oh. with something called Happy Mum, Happy Baby? Uh, I know. This is why. Why isn't this called Happy Mum, Happy Granny, Happy Mum, <laughs> Happy Baby? <laughs> well, that's the thing. I think it's interesting because you've seen every stage now. Mm. You know what I mean? You're kind mm. of you're mothering adults and and being the and being the grandma. Yeah. I'm not a very good grandma. Yeah. But then I don't think I was a very good mum either. I mean, I'm, I'm good in the sense that the children, I must have done something right because they're both doing well and they're happy and we're a very close family. It's all worked. But I did work a lot. Yeah. And I think women, especially nowadays, they have such guilt complexes about the amount of, that they work. Yeah. It didn't occur to me at the time. I didn't think I'm neglecting them. I just thought... Um, you know, I've got to do the work and they've got to go to school. You're providing for them in a different way. Yeah. And um, I don't, well, I don't know if they suffered or not, but I have, I just don't, I don't think the way I brought them up would be acceptable today. And I think if I had children today, I wouldn't do what I did then, which was pack them off to boarding school <laughs> at the age of 12 or something. And um, they were weekly boarding before that. Yeah. You know, when they were at sort of senior prep school. Um, but they loved it. And in fact, the, I remember the reason that we sent them to um, weekly boarding was because they complained so hard about the long drive to school. Oh, really? And they kept saying, why can't we be boarders? Because there's so much more fun for the boarders. They don't have to sit in the car all day being driven backwards and forwards. And they agitated too. Yeah. To start boarding. And I remember the first night that my son was staying at this school. The phone went and the matron was on the phone and said, Your son wants to speak to you. And I said to my husband, as he held the phone, I said, There you are, I told you he'd be unhappy. We should <laughs> never have done it. <laughs> and he passed she passed you know, he passed me the phone. And I said Daniel, Daniel, are you all right? And he said, yeah, I'm fine, Mum. Can I stay the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> well, I could have killed him. I said, no, you damn well can't. You come home because I'm missing you. <laughs> See, that's the thing. You say that you weren't a very good mum, but that's just kind of the fact that they were also content and happy to do that yeah. and that you you did care. It's not like you didn't care. It's just uh, something you were juggling so much. Yeah, yeah. What was your childhood like? I had a lovely childhood. I mean, this is the awful thing. Well, awful thing because it's a wonderful thing for me, but I feel very smug. People often ask me, you know, about my childhood. Mm. And, you know, I grew up in South Africa. It was very privileged, um, white, um, under apartheid mm -hmm. um, regime. And, you know, when you're a child, you don't even notice these things. And... Afterwards, I thought, how could I have borne it? You know, how could, you know, my mother was an anti-apartheid um, campaigner, so I knew about the politics. Yeah. But it didn't, I didn't really understand it. And uh, we were, you know, we were just having a lovely time. We had yeah. a beautiful big garden and enough money and, you know, it was all very colonial life. Mm. Because Lovely. Child, I had a. You're completely. You don't know. No, it any seemed of that. You know, everybody else had a nanny too, and a cook and a gardener, mm. and it never occurred to me that it was strange that they were all black and all the bosses were white. It just I grew up like that. Mm. My nanny, when we got on a bus, the nanny had to sit at the back of the bus, and we children sat in the front of the bus because we were white. I mean, it was the it was the most extraordinarily deep and evil thing. Yeah, but I didn't notice it because that and everybody did that. Yeah, was that a, a slow realization of what? I think when I went to university, I realized, but I wasn't really until then. I mean, I'd been to rallies with my mother, and yeah. I, I'd um, 
I'd signed up to the idea of anti-apartheid, that it was an evil thing, but I didn't. I'd never been into a black township um, like Soweto. Mm. Um, so I didn't really realize that huge gap of poverty and, and privilege until I went to university and started you know, really noticing. How did it make you feel when you did become aware? But so were, you, you, were you at uni here? Yeah, well, two things. I was at university in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And I started campaigning to let, um, we wanted black students to be allowed to come to Cape Town University. There was a black university, but it was really not a very good one. And we wanted black students to come to the university. So I started campaigning about that. And then when I got to France, which is when I really woke up, because I was finally in a European country, which was, I was away from apartheid. Mm. And... You know, it was just absolutely wonderful. I, I can remember walking down the Boule Miche and, um, you know, s sitting at tables eating couscous and, you know, young Nigerian men or Algerian men or or um, um, a lot of Moroccans in Paris at the time. It was just mm. terrific to suddenly be in a multicultural mm. society. But it was lovely. Yeah. You know, it was just so liberating and... What was your relationship like with your parents? Very good. My father was a businessman, but he was much more interested in literature and he was long to, to, to retire. He wanted to go and live in Portofino and read Shakespeare, really. Right. It had been his idea of heaven. My mother was an actress. There was a lot of arts and books in our family and it was really distressing to my father that I didn't read. I just wanted to... Ride horses. <laughs> I was really interested in horses. And then when I got tired of horses when I was about 14, then it was boys. Yeah. But it was so he never wanted to get back into the horses then. <laughs> and then he wished I, and then he would have. He, but I remember when we were filling in my form for university and there was a paragraph which asked you about your hobbies. Mm. And he was helping me fill it in and he said, I'd like to put reading in here, but I think I'll have to put boys <laughs> <laughs> for hobbies. <laughs> and I was so upset because, of course, it was true. No, no child likes the truth. Being <laughs> I was so cross with him. You know. Family-wise, mm. did you ever think forward to having your own family? Because you and Rain, you, your relationship, he already had children when you got together. Mm. So did that play a part in... Um, when I was young, I suppose I just assumed, because all of my generation did, that I'd get married. Mm. But then what happened was that I got really interested in my business and I didn't want to. Yeah. You know, marriage didn't come into it. And then I fell in love with Rain and until I was 34, I think, or 33, I didn't care if we were married or not because it was fine. It was yeah. lovely. But I, then I just like a hammer blow came this biological clock thing. I've got to have a baby, otherwise I'll be too old. Right. And it, it, um, today it would be 40, but then it was 35 was the cutoff point. And so I then desperately wanted a baby. But until then I'd barely thought of it. How did that conversation go with Rain? Because he was not as keen. He, he wasn't because... He was, um, he'd brought up three of his first wife's children from really when they were very little. The mm. youngest one was only a baby when they married because her first husband had been killed in the war. Right. And so there, when he met her, she was 20 years older than him and she had three young children. And he was only 24 or something and she was, um, I suppose, 40 or something. Mm. So he thought he'd done it and he didn't need to have children. But he understood that I wanted to have a child rather than just adopt one. But he was keen on adoption. He, knew, he, he didn't want children. When he saw that I really was determined and that he understood that, we both thought we can't have just one. Yeah. So we thought we'll have one for him and one for me and we'll, I'll make a baby, homemade variety, and then we'll get a Non-homemade variety. I love how you, you phrase it in the book, one homemade, one ready-made. <laughs> <One ready -made, laughs> yes. Because you were actually yeah. looking into adoption while you were pregnant as well. Yeah. Yes, yes, we were, because as soon as I got I got pregnant, um, 
and you know that was partly the the age thing. I thought, mm. well, we better get on with this. So we adopted Lida, and in those days, adoption was so much easier. Really, it was a private adoption, and she was she was a victim of the um, Khmer Rouge that her her parents had been probably killed in um, nineteen seventy four, something like that, and she was born that year. And then she, we, she was 16 months when we, when we adopted her. Mm. So she's Cambodian and she's the absolute light of my life. I adore her. Well, wasn't there something as well? I've, I've read it and I felt like fate had brought you together because wasn't she meant to go somewhere else so another family and ended up with you? Yeah, Lida's early life was really difficult. Mm. She was, her mother was killed by a rocket in um, Cambodia during the war. Her father, we don't really know, he disappeared and she was flown out because she was going to be adopted by an American married to an English woman mm. who wanted to live in England and so they they got her out and then they'd had her for about a week she was still a ward of court she was not not yet adopted by them but she they were allowed to have her and they'd had her for a week and then she died so that was the second mother she'd lost and then um, he was desperate because he had no wife. And he tried to take her to America with him mm. to go home. But of course she wasn't allowed in because she was alien. And he, he hadn't adopted her, so he, yeah. she was not legally his. So she ended up in France with some friends of his. And they wanted to adopt her. Right. And, and then their marriage fell apart. And the husband started to sue the wife for custody of his own children, of their children, claiming that she had been irresponsible to bring in this foreign baby into a rocky marriage, which sort of, you understand that. Yeah. So there was a real danger that she would end up in an institution, an orphanage or something. And then I'd never be able to adopt her because in France at that time, you couldn't adopt if you were under 40. Right. Because they waited for women to be sterile, and then they could adopt. Oh wow! Okay. In case you had your own babies, yes. or could make your own babies. So, um, anyhow, we heard about her, and so I went to see her, taking Daniel with me. Daniel was then a year, or eleven months, I think. We walked around the Bois de Boulogne together with this little thing, and she could run. <laughs> and Daniel was so lazy; he just sat on his bum. And do you know, he learned to run, stand up, walk and run in days because she could get to me in a flash. And he was sitting on his bottom, too, <laughs> too lazy to crawl. So he skipped the crawling stage, just stood up. and. What was it, it like when you met Lida for the first time? Well, the first time I met her um, was that time in France and she was fast asleep in a playpen on the floor on a mattress in a playpen and she had her little face squashed up against the um, bars of the playpen and she had lots of clothes on because the French woman who was looking after her believed for some strange reason that when you take a child out in the, for a walk you, you mustn't take their clothes off straight away when they come home you must let them cool down or something well, the poor child was sweating and <laughs> boiling hot <laughs> centrally heated French yeah. house um, she was not a pretty sight, <laughs> but, but oh, she was, she was a just, I mean, you just, you talk to any mother who's adopted her mm. child, they will tell you that it is love at first sight. You just think that baby's mine. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes you think that baby's not mine. And that's one of the difficult things about the way adoption works at the moment. You have to choose a baby pretty well on the internet. Yeah. You know, I mean, you look on digital picture you say you put your plea in I'll, I'd like to have that baby you don't see that baby until the day you take it away or until you, sometimes you may, it may be allowed to take a week to take mm -hmm. it away from its foster mum but if you decide not to have it then you go right back to the back of the okay. queue and it's another two years before you get offered another one yes so there's something crazy about it 
Oh, it's crazy when you think, so even with biological children, there's a whole thing about the bond yeah. and about how we all, you know, there's this thing that's said about the bond and it's yeah. instant. And actually for a lot of people, it's not instant. Yeah. You've had that whole yeah. like, crazy thing going on with birth yeah. and everything and all of a sudden aliens on you and it all yeah. feels quite overwhelming. But then for an adoption as well, it's something, so we've literally only this a series actually talked about adoption yeah. with Isma Almas. And it was really interesting listening to her because she's had uh, she had two biological children and then adopted yeah. and that fear of oh. actually going to meet and not knowing how you're going to feel I know and really frightened that you won't love the child enough yeah I mean I thought how can I love some strange child as much as I love Daniel I mean it's going to be an unequal thing this is going to be terrible for her it's going to be mm-hmm. terrible for me because I'm going to be having to pretend that I love her just as much as I love Daniel well in fact within days Within literally days, if you'd said to me, which baby will you save, you know, or you know, give the parachute to or whatever yeah. it is, I would say the nearest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just is, I mean, I, I can honestly put my hand on my heart and say that I love them both very differently. They're very mm. different. But like any creatures. children, yeah. Yeah. But there's no difference. In quantity. Yeah. Know. What was the age gap between them? Six months. Wow, that's a lot to have two one-year-olds. Yeah. Two two-year-olds was worse. <laughs> I can imagine the arguments and the unreasonable behaviour. <laughs> well, no, the worst thing was um, we were trying... That was what decided us that we had to live in the country because... We lived in Paddington and I used to take... In those days, it was more or less acceptable to take to have reins for children yeah. to stop them running under the bus. Actually, I still think that's a great thing. And we tried to buy some for my grandson the other day in Cape Town because we couldn't stop him running around. And it's just its a really nice way to hold mm. children and know they're safe. But there's all this thing that you're treating them like a dog so people don't like to have reins. But anyhow, I had reins for these two and we would go to the supermarket. And all I can say is that when we were in the supermarket, sometimes they would... St- lie down on the floor and scream <laughs> and when we were in the park they would run around and yeah. smile Yeah, and it was so obvious that mm-hmm. what they needed was to be able to run around outside and so we started thinking you know what, we don't want to live in a flat in Paddington <laughs> we yeah. want to get there. And so we bought our house in the Cotswolds yeah. which I still have must be so nice as well to have one house that they've grown up in yeah. and now their children are running around oh. And Daniel has three, and Lida has one adopted one. So Lida's Isn't adopted. it interesting that she's gone on to adopt? Yeah, she always wanted to adopt because she'd been adopted and she, she's the kindest woman you've ever met. She is just wonderful, and she has always said she'd adopt. And so she, she just adopted this one, who's absolutely divine. He's such a beautiful child. And now I hope she'll adopt another but you yeah. better get on with it. Because <laughs> it takes so long now. Mm. Yeah. It took four years. Oh, really? And she was lucky because she got a baby at a year. They have to speed it up. Mm. It's so bad for babies to be back and forth between foster parents and the courts and then they're with their birth mother and then back again. Yeah. What age has, uh, from childhood was the most difficult, most challenging? And well, they, obviously they would have been very different as well. Yeah, but Daniel wasn't very, was very unsocial at, mm. as a little boy. He never wanted to go to parties. I used to struggle to get him to... Of course, once he went to a party, he'd have a lovely yeah. time. You couldn't get him home, but he never wanted to go out to friends. And he didn't really want them to come and stay with him either. Um, he, wanted, he was just like his father. He would rather sit in the room with a book. <laughs> <laughs> even at four or five. But once he was there, he, he loved it. So that was, you know, and then Lida, the only thing I remember, I mean, when she was a teenager, like all girls, she was a bit wild and I was a bit worried about her. But, <laughs> you know, really, she, I once said to her, you were incredibly good as a young child, much much easier than I was. I mean, I realised I gave my mother and father a lot of grief. I mean, I was always falling in love with everybody, unsuitable, but she didn't do that too much. And I said to her, why are you so, why were you so good, do you think? And she said, she felt 
almost consciously, but she now thinks definitely un unconsciously, that because she'd been abducted and rescued from almost certain death, I mean, of course, it wasn't me who rescued her, it was this other guy, but because she'd been so lucky that she sort of owed us oh. to behave herself, yeah. which is rather a horrible thought because I, I never think your children owe you anything. I mean, you have them for your own delight yeah. and pleasure and satisfaction. They don't owe you anything. Yeah. And the thought that she would restrain her, you know, desire to, you know, I don't know what, go to the pub and get drunk just because, uh, you know, she felt she owed me something. But is there is there that point? Because I feel now, especially actually since writing my last book, and I know um, that you work with mm. your family on your book mm. as well sometimes, um, it's opened up conversations with my mum yeah. where we talk honestly. And, and, and that thing of, um, we had a chat the other day where she said to me, um, do you think I was a good mum? Was I enough? And it suddenly made me realise it doesn't matter what, how old your kids are, you're all like there always is that mother's guilt in a way mm. or that kind of assessing yourself or yeah. kind of I don't know it, it's your conversations change as they get older yes I think that's absolutely true and in fact Lita is often quite motherly to me oh, really and I suppose there's a moment and I certainly remember it with my mother when the sort of power shifts from one generation to the next and I remember when my mother was always very um she could be very duchessy. She's, mm. She was a bit formidable. And um, you didn't cross her. You know, she wasn't rude or anything, but she just had a sort of authority that, uh, as her child, I, I respected. And then there came a moment when I just, uh, just changed and I found I was looking after her yeah. and, um, and she was taking my advice. And I would say, I'll drive, Mum, <laughs> not... You know, do you want me to drive, Mum? Yeah. You know, it just changed. And I think that's about the cusp we're in with my children now, which is about time probably because I'm 80 and they're at 46, you know, so <laughs> it's time later. But, for example, trying to think about what we'll do about the house because, you know, I, Daniel's an MP in Devizes, Leader's going to Hollywood for at least a couple of years because she's now a filmmaker. Mm hmm and John and I think it's the house is too big for us, so we're building a small one. So what are we going to do? Yeah. And I, it's not my decision anymore. It's my house, but it's not my decision. I just think this is a family thing, and 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 I will do what they tell me. Yeah. What they want. So the the I think that tipping point comes. What well, Daniel said to me yesterday, "Mum, you're limping." <laughs> You know, go we were walking, <laughs> and uh, what's the matter? You know, it's so interesting because it is just different. Suddenly, they're concerned about you you being old, yeah, instead of you concerned about them being young. <laughs> it just changes. Yeah, how have you handled their relationships in terms of like so Daniel and leaders meeting people, their hearts getting broken because that's hard. Like that's so thinking to having to you know write recently and and thinking about my boys growing up. That's one thing that I really struggle with because you can't stop it from happening. How old are they? Uh, they are five, four, and one. I'm way <laughs> way away from it. I know. <laughs> I don't think you have to worry yet. <laughs> no, but it is that thing. I think because the book is kind of thinking to the future and what I hope for them. You know, it's that thing I hope for love for them, but at the same time, you know that love will at some point on your route Break to their finding hearts. it. Yeah. Well, Daniel has only really had two serious. I mean, he's had lots of girlfriends, but two really serious long-term affairs. And the first one was with a young woman that I was just thought he, she was perfect for him. Really? And then when he met Emma, I thought she wasn't perfect for him. And it's the most interesting lesson to learn is that you can be so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was convinced that Emma um, was too scattered-brained. She's very artistic. She's an actress. Um, and I know, knew he wanted to be a politician. And I thought, you know, that's just not the right kind of wife for you. And I remember saying so and writing it. And I mean, I was really, sounds ridiculous now because I so adore her. 
but I was her enemy, really. I really? did not want... I didn't think she was right for Daniel. And anyway, but of course he knew that I was... What point did you change your mind on that? Well, I remember talking to Lida about it and saying... Um, if they were they were off an island or somewhere, yeah. And I said, if she comes back with a ring on her finger, you know what? We're going to love her. We are going to love her, and we're going to do it immediately because once she's, they've decided that's yeah. it. Yeah. And that's what happened. And she is absolutely perfect. She's not. She's still not able to. She's still scatterbrained. She's still scatterbrained. <laughs> she's still hopeless that all the things. She, she's still hopeless that all the things that I objected to. Yeah. But you know what? They are trivial things. Mm. The things that matter is that she absolutely adores Daniel. She's the most wonderful mother. She's fantastically patient, and she's. And when I see how Emma brings up her children, I think that's what I should have done. But of course, <laughs> I would never have done it. I'm too selfish to do that. She she will spend. Hours, I mean, all day, playing with them, teaching them. They're all way ahead of their classes because she's always read with them and she's always played with them. And she, she's all, she's a teacher, and so right. she teaches all the time, even when they're playing. She does. They don't realize it. She is amazing. Mm. And you know what? If she doesn't put the lid on the milk bottle top, it doesn't matter. <laughs> So a great lesson in kind of not getting involved and yeah, kind of I mean, leaving them. Leaving them to it. Yeah. Um, but I still, uh, you know, I, I don't think it mattered that I said it because yeah. it was uh, out in the open. They both knew. Mm. Um, she's managed to forgive me. <laughs> well, I don't think, you know, I mean, she must have known that in a sense it was my worry that she wasn't right for Daniel, not that I thought she was an evil yeah. person, you know. Because she's certainly not that. And um, anyway. Has it been difficult to let them go? I mean, I know they went to boarding school, so I said, no. <laughs> so to a certain extent, they were kind of not at home all the time. But is there a very, is there a, like a finality about them actually moving out of home? Yeah, well, they always say that, don't they? That you, you know, your daughter's your daughter for life. And, mm. you know, no, I don't think so because. Um, it's very funny because families are just so different, aren't they? I mean, our family is extremely close and loving, but we hardly ever see each other. It's same. not... Mine's the same, yeah. It's not a... On the other hand, leaders in laws um, are really good with her and their... Matt takes um, leader home to his parents much more than they come to me. I don't mind. Mm. Um, it's what they, his parents love. Matt likes going home to his own family home, so they spend quite a lot of time there. Leaders in laws are much better grandparents than I am. See, you're not thinking that you're hard on yourself because you've already said about not being a good mum and not being a good grandma. Uh, you know what? <laughs> um, Anne Hope, um, leader's mother-in-law. Every time I see. Our grandchild, if, when he's got he's got new little slippers on, I said, "Don't tell me who gave them those," because I know it'll be Anne. She she loves shopping. She loves buying them things. She's very good at it. She spends happy hours thinking up presents and treats. And you know, if you go there for Easter, it'll be a whole Easter hunt and beautifully yeah. arranged. And same with Christmas. And her whole life, it seems to me, is about pleasing her children and her grandchildren. It's wonderful to watch. <laughs> I don't even remember their birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel has to Daniel now has taken to emailing me three days before one of his children's birthdays say, Don't forget it's Charlotte's birthday oh, which reminds me. <laughs> this is someone's birthday coming up. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's Lida's birthday. <laughs> Do you feel like you've just become aware that mm. we're all different? Mm. And actually, it's accepting that we are what we are. We are who we are. And actually, we all we all just want the same, which is our children to be happy and live healthy <laughs> lives. But we all go about it in very different ways. I'm sure that is. A, I'm sure. I'm sure that's right. And actually, they children and grandchildren they all need different things anyway. Yeah. And then 
they need different things from different people. Yeah. Um, my children, what they expect expected from Rain was not that he would play cricket with them on the lawn, but that he would read them stories. Yeah. And what they expected from me was not that I would ever go to. <laughs> I mean, I never turned up at, um, you know, the touchline and watched them play sport or mm. I never I once went to watch Lida rowing when she was at university on a freezing cold wet day watching your daughter pounding up the ice as, in a rowing boat I thought I'll never do this again and I, there's a good reason why I've never done it before <laughs> <laughs> I'm too selfish you know and I I remember when um, we went swimming in the public baths and um Leader's a very good swimmer, and this coach chap came up to me and said, is that your little girl? And I said, yes. And he said, she's a terrific swimmer, and she could really go far. He said, if you want to let her come to my coaching lessons every Saturday, I'll, um, I, you know, she, she could be in the Oxfordshire team by the time she's, you know, whatever. And he wanted her, and... I could just see Saturday mornings going out of the window. And I thought, I don't want to sit in a swimming pool smelling of chlorine, waiting for some wet child to get <laughs> out of the pool. And I'm afraid, I said quick as a flash, um, she does pony club on Saturdays, <laughs> which was not true. <laughs> and so you know, I'm afraid not. I probably denied her an Olympic... Um, Anyway, oh. when I told her this, she said, Mum, I'm glad you didn't make me go swimming every Saturday. <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, in the end, you do what you, yeah. uh, what makes you happy. And it makes Anne Hope really happy to um, provide for her, uh, physically provide yeah. lots of toys and clothes. I, I, I'm just not good at it. I, you know, I walk up and down and I think, does will that suit him? Will that Oh, he's got enough trousers and enough rompers and enough. I reckon you provide and give them in a very different way. And they'll love seeing you for something different. Yeah. Than, um, you know. Yes. I like doing things with the children that I like doing. You see, this is yeah. what... <laughs> I mean, the thing about why Emma's so good, she'll do things that they like doing. Mm -hmm. So I'll see her on the lawn um, when Malachi says, when he was 10, you know, he's training for some race at school and he, she will be with a stopwatch and he'll be running up and down the lawn and she'll be telling him how many seconds I mean that would bore me to tears but I will cook with them yeah. because they're very good at it and they love it and we make stuff together um, we haven't done it for a while but we used to make a lot of necklaces together because mm -hmm. I, I like making necklaces yeah. and um and they are fascinating to do that with them because they all do such different things. Yeah. I mean, Malachi is really off the wall and artistic. If you give him a bunch of stuff, he will put on a necklace, a cotton reel right. or a little um, stick or all sorts of strange things, but very colourful and very big and bold, but definitely with a style. Yeah. Them. And Scarly the girl who will like tiny little beads that are so small you can hardly pick them up with your fingers, take hours to do it, and he, she will make shiny, pink, girly, yeah. very delicate, tiny little necklaces with a lot of patience. Yeah. Gabriel, who's the youngest, um, likes breaking necklaces. <laughs> He likes seeing the <laughs> explosion. Like a child. <laughs> he likes um, to, to see things busting. Do you feel like you've been able to enjoy your grandchildren? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't see quite enough of them. I'd like to see more. Now they're going to live in, I mean, be in Dubai's as most weekends. Right. I'll see a bit less of them. Um, so I might have to get off my bottom and go to Dubai's. <laughs> Has it made you reflective, though, them coming into your lives? Uh, reflective? Hmm. Do you know, I don't think I'm reflective. Don't you? No, I'm not. Um, I'm really very in the moment and thinking forwards all the time. I don't, I don't really reflect enough. I'm, 
I don't think. Yeah. I just, I just do things as they come. Yeah. And I'm very practical. I think I'm quite, um, I'm quite easy and tolerant. I think. It's <laughs> a good way to be. So my um, my book that I wrote, wrote this year was a series of letters on motherhood. Uh-huh. And this series, I've been asking people, if you could write a letter on motherhood, who would it be to and what would it say? I think it would be to 25-year-olds. And what I would be saying is, yes, independence is important. Yes, but don't leave it too late. Because so many young women I know because they've been so um, fixed on their career and so confident that these days you don't have to have your babies early. And then they get to, as Lida did, to heading for 30, 35 or something like that. And then what happened to Lida was that she got breast cancer at the moment when she wanted to get pregnant. And then it takes five years for those drugs that you end up taking to get out of your system. And in that five years, you can't have babies because the um, body rejects them. Yeah. And if you want to have children, and most women do, but not all. Uh, you know, I've got a few friends who've never wanted children and they're very happy, so I don't think you have to want children. But if you want them, I would give you a letter about... Um, just thinking what does really matter to you because if you there's no such thing as having it all you can have 90 percent of it but something goes you do live with a bit of guilt if you work a lot you definitely lose a lot of your independence you lose a lot of sleep there's a lot wrong with it (laughs) but if you really want children it's easier to do it in your 30s than your 40s yeah and probably easier in the 20s very true. How old are you? That's really interesting. I'm 35. And you've got three? Yeah. Yeah, well, you did it right. Yeah, and I'm done. The shop is shut. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> well, you see, but that's really nice to know, you mm. see. But if you were 39 yeah, and wanting to have children, just the anxiety, mm-hmm. oh, oh, my goodness, am I going to be over the hill? It just makes it less likely that you'll get pregnant. Yeah. Touching on that, on Lida and breast cancer that must have been a really difficult time because I think Mm. it's that thing of little children little problems Mm. and when we're talking about bigger problems as they get older Mm. that must have been a really Mm. scary time very scary very scary but she's really philosophical she's an amazing girl she's she's very philosophical and in a way she made it very easy for us all because she was determinedly cheerful and I mean, she, she did one or two things that I think were probably unnecessary, but they helped her. Yeah. She went off to some crazy healer in Brazil or something, and I can't tell whether that helped her or whether she was, um, you know, clear of cancer because of that. Yeah. I mean, she's quite sort of spiritual leader in a st- funny way. I mean, I sometimes think she believes in anything. <laughs> she, <laughs> right. she may not believe in, in uh, um, a Christian God, but she's sort of slightly Buddhist, and she sometimes, I think she she believes in ghosts. I'm not sure she doesn't believe in reincarnation. I mean, <laughs> God knows what she believes. But these things help her. You yeah. Know? She. I'm so down to earth that you know I always think, oh, that's nonsense. <laughs> things like... Um, I mean, I'm always surprised that really practical things work. I always think nothing will work. You know, if you, I can see the point of um, good food and exercise and yeah. obvious things like that. But um, things like Reiki, I don't think that's nonsense. And yet when Rain died and I was so miserable and my sister-in-law gave me a Reiki session, it was absolutely fantastic. Really? And it was you know, it sort of worked. It was calming and helpful. 
And yet I still sort of don't believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing at the time, but... <laughs> OK, I finish every episode with you finishing these three sentences. All right. Being a mum means... Everything. Since having children, I... I'd say since having children and grandchildren, yeah. I've sort of realised the point of life. And you say you're not reflective. That's such a reflective answer. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Well, I've only done the reflection right now. Because <laughs> I'm prompting you. And, um, and I would never have sat down and thought no. about it. So that's what I love but doing. It is, my, mm. I force people to sit down and think. Yes, you do. And we don't. And it's a busy world. And I think we don't yeah. just sit down yeah. and think. Yeah. And um, I'm happy when? I'm happy when I'm at the end of the table and I'm doling out something like cassoulet or a big bean stew or shepherd's pie to the entire family, including my brother and yeah. cousins and nephews and nieces. I like being the provider, the, the feeder, the nourisher. The, I like doling stuff out. And I think, for now as well, I think people are trying to do everything. Mums are trying to do the jobs and and you are uh, such a huge... Um, uh, well, you just showed that actually providing means lots of different things. Yeah. And I don't think you should be hard on yourself because I think actually what you've done is you've provided for your kids and your grandkids in a very different way. And I think it's beautiful. So thank you for coming on and chatting. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.